Welcome back everybody, Clint here today with Matt. What's up guys? We're with Classic Firearms and we're coming at y'all today with some more surplus, which is nice because it seems like surplus is just hard to come by. Yeah, man, I mean, once it's gone, it's gone. They, yeah. By definition, they're not making it anymore. So once, uh, you know, it's kind of hard to get in. Yeah, well, I mean, I guess during this time right now too, we just haven't seen a whole lot of new, well, we're not gonna see anything new, but a whole lot of, <laughs> lot of imported, I will say new surplus, right? right? So we actually got some pretty cool things and we got some infield jungle carbines in, which are pretty cool guns. They are. They definitely have some history to them. They've got some, rumors about them, I guess you could say, but let's they go have ahead. a reputation. Yeah, they've got a reputation, right, as being super loud for one. But uh, we've got actually two different types for you guys to take a look at today. We've got some uh, refinished ones here that have all new bluing on them, maybe some light cleaning on the stock, but the stocks look pretty, pretty They're untouched. not refinished, just, yeah. re -clean, just cleaned up. Just yeah. cleaned up, yeah, but we do have some fresh bluing on the metal parts. And of course we have them as kind of like a turn-in condition yep. over here without any kind of touching to the metal and all. So if you wanted to take a look at these, let's go ahead and show off a couple really quick as we get into a little bit of history about them. Because first off, they are Lee Enfield rifles. They do have the infield chambering, or I should say infield uh, bolt action, which is different from what most of us know, because mm -hmm. most of your Mauser actions, which are very popular, are pretty much a cock on open, as to where this is a cock on close, That's right? right? That's so right. you wanna explain that action a little bit or why they kinda decided to go with that? So you can see that the uh, striker on this is already cocked. Right. And it's under spring tension, so when I open it up, it kinda pops. But you'll notice so right now it's the striker is, is down. So you're actually, you know, cocking that striker as you close the action, and they felt that that was kind of a biomechanical way to do that. Yeah. You're pushing and you get get a lot of easier force pushing to close it and cock at the same time as right. opposed to with a traditional Mauser. It's when you have the striker down, and we're just going to double check that again. But you know, so when the striker is down, you cock it when you open the chamber on a Mauser design, and you can yeah. see that that's not what happens here. So. Uh, the Mauser action certainly is more popular. It's the one yeah. that's kind of stood the test of time. It's the one right. based on, you know, most hunting rifles and things are based on today. Right. But this was an interesting other way to go about it because they felt it was going to be much faster to run. Yeah. So, yeah. Uh, it is Which unique. makes the sense. Yeah. And it gives you the, uh, the opportunity to perform the mad minute, right? Yeah. Isn't that what they call it with these guys? Yeah. But as Matt said too, you can definitely see when it's under spring tension, when the striker's in the firing position, you'll notice when I just flip up the bolt here, Thing shoots right on back, right. right? And it does make sense too, because you can do that motion right there. You get a very affirmative like yeah. push down, right? Right, so it feels pretty good to do that. Now what's cool is, uh, I have actually have a question. Were these original Lee Enfields that were just cut down and then and then uh, weight reduced, or were these designed and created as their own thing? So, you know, the number five carving was produced uh, in two factories in England, so there's a uh, the Zachary, yeah, and exactly. then uh, yeah. also Birmingham Small Arms Factory. Yeah. So uh, they were produced as number five carbines. Uh, certainly you can imagine that because it is based off of the previously existing infield action that certain components could have been used like as they're in the middle of manufacturing receivers and barrels, right. that they could have uh, could have made alterations into that production line. So uh, there's a lot of lightning cuts to the receiver, even cuts to the barrels to help reduce weight. Yeah. Uh, they've drilled out the bolt handles to just take off that little bit much more weight. And of course you can see they've removed a ton of wood on the stock. Yeah, I mean, it is a lightweight rifle and it makes sense, right? Jungle carbine, you're gonna be moving around in an area that's probably not the most comfortable to be moving around in with right. such a long rifle. So cutting it down makes sense. And it kind of makes me take a look at the flash hider supposedly up here, AKA the Loudner, right? <laughs> but uh, it makes sense too, again, in a jungle atmosphere, you don't want any type of muzzle device that might be picking up, mm -hmm. you know, brush or whatever else when you're kind of walking through the woods there. So I get that. That makes sense. Pretty so, yeah, cool guns. The uh, you know the British, and at this time we're talking about British, not just English. Uh, right. You know, in their uh, experiences in World War II, especially in the Pacific theater, where they were, you know, Australian soldiers and maybe people from India were going through to different uh, Pacific islands, and there's a lot of jungle terrain. They decided they wanted a lighter weight, handier rifle. Yeah. And that continued into kind of several of their colonial conflicts that uh, uh, after the war. Uh, that they, they decided to use this, but it does have basically the shortest service life of almost any service rifle really? I have heard. So how long? Uh, so it was adopted in 1944, yep. and they decided to stop making them in 1947. Oh, wow. So are there reasons behind that maybe? Well, some of them are uh, kind of more rumors. So like 
they actually released an official report at the time that the rifles had a wandering zero issue. So okay. you could not zero it and then yeah. rely on it to go back to that when you shot it later. Oh my goodness. Uh, okay. No modern, you know, I mean, think about it. There's plenty of YouTube channels out there, plenty of guys who love surplus and film yeah. it and put it on the internet. Uh, it, it's really kind of weird that nobody has really shown a huge wandering zero effect in modern yeah. uh, science, but certainly you can kind of understand when there are these lightning cuts in the receiver, lightning cuts in the barrel. Yeah. Uh, even though it's a shorter barrel, so it should be more rigid, uh, you also have extra weight where they've added this kind of muzzle brake, mm -hmm. that it does put some stresses. And I think one of the big things that people consider is the fact that we are talking about conflicts in a general situation. It's hot, yeah. it's humid, wood swells, it warps, it bends. Yeah. It applies pressure to the barrel in different ways. Yeah, that makes it's sense. It's not gonna be consistent. Right, that makes sense. So I've been showing you guys as uh, Matt's been giving us a little bit of history on these, um, some of the different options that we have. These are the re-blued ones, the cleaned up ones, we'll call them. And then we've got these guys, more of their original condition that you see right here. You'll notice this one right here, very, very light bluing left on the barrel and muzzle device on this guy. In and, the white, yeah. Yeah, and yeah, right. And as you can see, also too, we're leaving these guns as is. We're not gonna be taking off any type of, uh, I'll call it aftermarket. So parts of string or leather straps from a sling that used to be, we're gonna be keeping there for you guys. I always thought personally that anytime I saw that, or trench markings, different types of uh, cartouches or stampings like, like what we're seeing on a few of these stocks. I always thought that was really cool. And I'm glad that when these got cleaned up, they didn't do many work, like much work other than, again, just kind of maybe wiping it down. Because like, for instance, this mark, which I think is a pretty cool looking one, we got a similar one on the one I was just handling there. It's not one that I, really typically seen before. So mm -hmm. I'm not sure what its representation is. I mean, I don't know if you've got any more insight on it. I mean, obviously that one's very worn. It's hard to make out exactly what it was. Yeah. This one uh, to me appears to be possibly just like a, uh, an arsenal, like a, a ordnance marker. Cause yeah. you know, it looks like there's obviously a crown. It's hard to make out any of the writing inside of here. Yeah. It kind of reminds you of like, you know, the bomb. Yeah, the bursting uh, bomb that from, you see from like Springfield Armor. Yeah, like Springfield Armor. Yeah. So it looks like it's probably some kind of ordnance uh, or arsenal acceptance mark. Yeah. Um, on the other hand, you know, you have things like, you know, this very simple rack number. Yeah, which could be a six or a nine, depending on how it's oriented. So that might be a little confusing. Yeah. <laughs> um, that one down there has got definitely a very dirty 28. Yeah. So, you know, you can see that somebody yeah. just slathered paint yeah, on that right. stock. So, um, I mean, I think, again, I think that's just really cool. Like some of the, um, uh, you know, Battlefield turn-in gallants that mm -hmm. we got, that were, the, these are the Galil parts kits that we had. A lot of those came in and they had like the fluorescent paint on them. So that way you could identify friendly if you're walking in darkness, whatever. I always think that stuff's really cool. Yeah. And personally, I would get one of those. And well, it helps connect you to the it. history, the story behind the yeah. rifle, because, you know, all of these rifles have, have traveled around, right? Yeah. So they started in, in England, they might have traveled all the way to the Pacific into a conflict, yeah. they could have gone to Africa. I mean, right. the British Empire went around the world, and even though they were only produced for three years, they still stayed in service for a little bit longer than that. Yeah. Um, so yeah, you know, these things have gone places and possibly done things. Yeah, so like, for instance, I'm just imagining with some of the trench art that we have here, looks like some soldier was practicing making some stars on his stock and then looks like something over here, like a really crappy game of tic-tac-toe maybe or something was played back here on the stock. Again, something that's just like, how bored are you? And I get it. Totally get it. You know, I, I get, you know, maybe you're on watch somewhere and you're like, man, I'm just trying to stay awake. I'm a doodle in the stock with my pocket knife. You know what you I mean? Yeah, the quartermaster for the Marine Corps would be pretty happy with that. Qu the quartermaster, we don't know quartermasters, but know. you know, the uh, Sergeant of the Guard, yeah, I'm sure he'd be real happy about it. Actually, I don't think they'd care. It'd be the armorer when you go to turn back in your gun, but you know, whatever. But anyway, again, what we're wanting to do here is just show you the different variations that we have to offer. We've got the, uh, I, I don't want to call them dirty, but they're not the cleaned up ones that we have to offer. And James River Armory always does a good job at the rebluing. I think that's really where their bread and butter is when it comes to this. I think if we were doing like internal design, we'd call this rustic. Rustic, I like it. There you go, very artful, tasteful, right? So, but anyway, very neat stuff. And if you want, go ahead and show a couple more of those. I've been showing these guys off quite a bit here. So again, this is that one with that rack number. You can kind of just see the, you know, history on it. Yeah, and also too, we've talked quite a bit about the infield action on this, guys. If you would like to see a video where maybe Matt and I head to the range, I think we've got maybe a K98 or two we could compare. I mean, yeah. So we have a we mouse, yeah, I think so. I think I think Ryan might have one in his personal collection. Oh. But uh, if we actually wanted to do maybe, I don't want to say a run and gun because I'll probably embarrass myself. 
But I definitely embarrass myself. Yeah, yeah, but it's fine. But maybe we could perform the Mad Minute, a Mauser action versus a infield action and see which one is actually quicker. Sure. And uh, of course, these are all chambered in 303 British, which is a fantastic cartridge. And yeah. Why do you make that face? I, I like the 303 British, yeah. but so, you know, it is a full size RAF cartridge. Oh, yeah. And I, I always thought of 303 British as being something that was a little bit lighter recoiling, say 7.65 mm -hmm. 54 r or something. But this is a, a rifle that will make you fear the 303 British <laughs> from the shooter's perspective. Yeah, right. So, well, like I said, it's got a Loudner on the end, right? I mean, so they've, they've taken two <laughs> pounds off the weight of like a number four. Yeah. So, uh, for instance, they added, yeah. a, they added a butt pad, a recoil pad yeah. that reduces the amount of, of shoulder you get in contact with it. And yeah. And it actually increases your perceived recoil. Yeah, so let's show that shoulder pad off a little bit here though, because I get that they tried to put a softer material there mm -hmm. to maybe try to cushion the recoil. <laughs> maybe it was softer at the point of install, but yeah, it yeah. is solid yeah. now. Yeah. And so, yeah, like Matt was saying, this actually reduces the amount of surface area that's in contact with your shoulder. So that means all of that recoil is being focused into a smaller area on your body. Yeah. So it might not be the most pleasant gun to shoot, but I'm willing, I'm willing to mag dump it for you guys. It's, it's only in my Instagram. I mean, you gotta keep that, uh, you yeah, gotta I, keep I, up I, that reputation. That's right, you know? So if I can mag dump 50 cals, I'm pretty sure I can handle a jungle carbine. Yeah. Unless the action whoops my butt, which, hey, we'll find out. So again, let us know down in the comment section below, would you like to see a Mauser action versus infield action? We're talking old school guns too, nothing new school. We're talking surplus and, different sides of the war, <laughs> that's for sure. But it's always a good time. Now, granted, we have a 1903 on the wall as well. So if you'd like to see maybe some American surplus, there you go. All right, I think we can leave it off there. I wanna hear from you guys down in the comment section below. I have actually seen quite a few jungle carbines in my life without realizing what they were. Right. Uh, when I was growing up, one, one of my best friends, uh, their dad was like, like, hey, Clint, you're big into guns. And he showed me this old gun and I'm like, I don't know what that is, right? And I was like, you know, 15, 16, and I'm like, I have, I don't know, it looks like kind a of gun. At first glance, it does look kind of like a sporterized version it of, does. of an infield. Yeah, that, and that's what I had. So later in life, when I started to grow up and know a little bit more, not much more, uh, that's what I kind of thought when I started seeing jungle carbines. I'm like, who would sporterize an infield? And then I saw what people would do to SKSs, and well, okay, I understand. But uh, all the strikes again. Yeah, <laughs> that's okay. Do what you want to your gun. It's your gun. Go out there and wear your body armor and kit too, all you civilians. Go out there and get some training. Sweat hard, train hard. Anyway, just wanted to go on that tangent. Um, so yeah, the jungle carbines are super cool guns, and I would actually think it would be pretty fun if we went out and had a range day. It's been a while since you've been out the range with us. Yeah. All right, last thing I want to talk about. One time too. Yeah, yeah that's right. Uh, the last thing I want to talk about, unfortunately, isn't surplus. And the reason I say unfortunately, because if this was a surplus FAL, maybe the automatic in FAL would mean it's automatic. <laughs> But it's not. It is the DS Arms SA-58, however, which I'm calling the modernized FAL. This sweet girl is a fantastic shooter. 7.62 NATO, which is a pretty comparable round to the 303 British. Very similar, I think. Uh, 20 round polymer mag that it comes with. Decent mag. Nice. M-Lock grip or M-Lock rail that we have up here with the M-Lock BCM grip. And we, like I said, I made it the modernized FAL. So we went ahead, add the tactical fore end, mm -hmm. the Picatinny dust cover on it with the battle rifle optic. That is the bro, bro. sight. All right, and you can, still, yeah, you can still utilize your iron sights on it, which is pretty cool. And also the upgraded grip on this to mimic more of like the 249 saw. Mm -hmm. And so very comfortable gun, a lot of fun to shoot. SA-58, that's not only the designation of this rifle, but also, also the code. code. Yeah, yeah, it's also the code word. And did you know, 20,000 likes on the giveaway video for the SA-58, 20,000 likes, and we'll bring you another Barrett 50 cal giveaway. You give away too many Barrett's that no one ever. Yeah, right? So you can never give away too many Barrett's. Now granted, sure, we were gonna give away another Barrett, but without approval, I said, hey, Let's give away another one sooner because you guys seem to like them. And if uh, the marketing team will listen to 20,000 likes, we'll, we'll make it done. So yeah. that's all there is to it. Mm, sweetness. Now, you do know that the A in Fusil Automatic Leisure means automatic, even in semi-automatic. Yeah, I get it. But when I hear automatic, it's, it's still I think, an auto loader. I mean, I get it. But when I hear automatic, I think third position and giggle switch. You know what I mean? 
Gun Control Act and the NFA are unconstitutional and should be repealed. ATF, leave braces alone. I'm gonna leave it off there, guys. As always, we appreciate you and your business. God bless. We'll see you next time at ClassicFirearms.com. Right arm of the free world.